Hello, everybody. Um, let's get started. Thank you for being here today. I'm Sean Hargreaves. I lead the Direct 3D team at Microsoft. And I'm joined for this talk by my colleague, Austin, who leads the PIX team. And also colleagues Rob from AMD and Wesson from NVIDIA. It's great to have you both here today. Thank you to support the talk and show some demos later on. A couple of little housekeeping things before we get going. Please um, silence cell phones, and please do complete the evaluation forms after the talk. So today, we're going to cover a bunch of different things that have been happening in Direct3D over the last couple of years. We have a couple of new features that we're introducing, work graphs and DirectSR. We're going to give an update on the latest in PIX, and then also go over a few other smaller things. I want to start by saying it's just really nice to be here. It's really great to see everybody in person. The last time I was going to talk at GDC, we had a whole bunch of talks prepared and slides written, and we'd rehearsed them, and we were going to talk about mesh shaders and sampler feedback and DX12 Ultimate and what became feature level 12.2. But as you can see from the date of this blog post, that was March of 2020, so it ended up as a blog post. And yeah, since then, we have released a few things. We released Shader Model 6.6, .6, Shader Model 6.7, Direct Storage. Those have all been either you know, virtual calling into conferences or you know, online releases only. So it feels really good to have people back here sharing a room and talking about graphics tech. I'm going to start by talking about work graphs, which is a feature that's been in development for a long time, partnering with folk from across the industry. And we released the first official build of work support for work graphs just last week. So this has moved from many years of talking and dreaming and wondering if it might be possible to like a real thing that you can use and ship today. I'm going to start with a little bit of history. because Work graphs are really all about making GPUs more self-driving. And the history of GPUs has been pushing towards self-driving for years, starting with this is a photo of an ATI Rage 3D Pro GPU from 1997, which was not a self-driving GPU. It had no programmability. It just rasterized triangles. And the CPU had to do all the per vertex math and feed it triangles one by one. Big step forward came around about 2001. This is a GeForce 3. And that had some level of programmability. It introduced programmable shaders, although in a very limited form compared to what we have today. And it had a fully hardware TNL pipeline. So it could self-drive at the level of, you know, here's a draw call. And the GPU would just go and process that entire draw call with no CPU intervention. Step forward a few, few more years. 2008 saw the launch of Direct3D 11. And these are a couple of like, the typical GPUs, first GPUs to support that feature set. D3D 11 brought us actually a big step forward in self-driving, which was the draw indirect and dispatch indirect, along with compute shaders. And that's kind of where we've stuck ever since. Yeah, that's a programming model where the CPU can record an instruction for the GPU to later do something that it doesn't quite yet know what it's going to be. And then on the GPU timeline, earlier GPU work can fill in, OK, this is exactly what I'm going to draw. This is exactly what I'm going to dispatch. D3D12 generalized the indirect model a little bit to the execute indirect API that we have today. But fundamentally, that's where we've been stuck. And I'm going to talk a bit more in a minute about yeah, that, that model has been pushed really hard by creative people. You know, a lot of you in this room have pushed it, I would say, to the limit and quite a bit beyond the limit of what's reasonable to do <laughs> with, with such, a, such an API. And we, you know, we're really kind of creaking at the seams of what's possible there, hence work graphs. So last year, in 2023, around about a year ago, we introduced a preview of this functionality with some very early driver support. Um, our partners have been working hard ever since on making drivers faster and more complete. We've been polishing the functionality, proving out some demos, heading towards shipping it for real. So let's start with why. You know, what, what's wrong with Execute Indirect? Um, someone early, I, I'm going to use more formal language in this talk, but I've, I've heard Execute Indirect described as a hot mess, and it kind of is in a lot of ways. You know, this is typically how some code using ex Execute Indirect to do some typical rendering task might be structured. You have a dispatch that does some visibility determination or material binning or whatever it is. And then you have to do a barrier before you can consume the result of that dispatch. And then you can do a bunch of indirect calls based on what was previously computed. So if we're doing something like material binning, the way this is going to work, 
that dispatch is going to write into a, a few different buffers, holding you know, the visual, visible objects, a separate buffer for each material. That's pretty simple. It's just an you know, order depend, an atomic operation to add a new object to the buffer. And then after the barrier, each of those execute indirects is going to consume one of the buffers and draw the appropriate set of objects. Now, that works. You, this is an incredibly simple diagram, but if you look at a, you know, a modern game, there's typically far more complexity, huge numbers of these things, chains of multiple levels of these things. It works. There are some problems. A huge one is that barrier. That is a global synchronization point. And the more complicated your usage of execute indirect gets, the more of this kind of global sync point you're going to need. We don't like global sync points very much. Uh, the whole point of a GPU is to be a massively parallel computing device. And any time you say, all of it, stop, yeah, that's leaving performance on the table. It's particularly painful because typically, if that dispatch is doing anything interesting, all the threads involved in the dispatch are not going to finish at the same time. You know, some, some ray casting is going to have to just go much deeper and <coughs> take longer than others. If it's a recursive scene traversal visibility determining algorithm, a whole bunch of threads are going to trivially reject while others continue and have to do far more work. So you get in this pattern where, like, OK, the GPU is full. We went, we went wide. We had a lot of parallel work. Some of that work is finished, and the GPU is getting less and less utilized until the absolute longest straggler thread finishes. And then the barrier can satisfy, and we can proceed to the indirect work. Don't love that inefficiency. Another big problem is how big should we allocate these buffers? That's got to be worst case. There's no kind of dynamic way to grow them. And worst case can be pretty bad. You know, there are some cases where we just waste a lot of memory. There are other cases where algorithms are just fundamentally infeasible because the amount of scratch space needed for these indirection buffers is going to be so large. Another big problem, these execute indirects have to go in some kind of order. And the, the model, when you record things into a command list, is, is fundamentally serialized. We, we can't process draws in a different order to what they were submitted in. But there's not typically actually any need for those things to be in a particular order. It sure would be nicer if we're doing visibility determination. If the first object we find has a given material on it, well, why can't we get going shading that material first? Because it's the first one we found. These operations are also often empty. And that can be a huge performance sink, where you end up with this list of thousands of execute indirects for materials that might or might not be visible in the current frame. But the command processor has to chew through them all, one after another, just to determine they're empty and skip on to the next thing. Final problem, all of this data access is not going to be well optimized for locality. You know, we ideally want to be operating out of cache, out of local memory, keeping things on a single shader core. When you're writing back to these buffers, filling the whole buffer with all of the everything for the whole scene, and then processing it later, that's just kind of inherently not going to be very well localized. So we look at all that and think, boy, that's a lot of red. Can we do better? And that's why we've been investigating work graphs. Fundamentally, <laughs> a work graph is a compute shader that can launch another compute shader. These are structured as a graph of nodes, where each node is a compute shader function. Um, shader code at each node can in request other nodes. And it does this by passing them a payload structure. So it's kind of a message passing function call style. It's all asynchronous. There's no return from these calls. You just lob a request off, and it will get picked up by the implementation and executed at some later time. There is some capacity for recursion up to a limited level, not infinite recursion. There's a few different options for how you can launch a node. Um, this is designed in such a way that you can support streaming materials by adding new nodes to an existing graph without having to recompile the whole graph. So in a streaming engine, you can you know, load new shaders as, as the world progresses. And a really important capability is that nodes can be stored in arrays and indexed. So you can programmatically and efficiently select which node you're going to send a message to. Now, that's really important for things like bin, any kind of binning algorithm or material selection. And you're fundamentally indexing into an array of nodes in a message passing programming model. You can think of it as kind of like the equivalent of a virtual function call or a switch statement. I mentioned this is just HLSL. This is an example, very, very simple work graph shader. 
The key things to notice here is that the shader has some annotations at the top of it to indicate that it is a node in a work graph. It takes some input and output structure, which are the nodes that it will, it, it takes a payload as input, which is what it was passed by the other node that requested invocation. And that's just, you know, user-defined structs, any information that you want to pass through. Preferably small if you want this to run fast, but yeah, they can be fairly large. And then the output is other nodes that this is going to write to, if it, if it chooses to invoke other nodes. This particular shader doesn't really do any computation itself, so it's a little bit pointless, but it's a you know, sample. This is how it looks up a node that it's going to write to and outputs another payload struct to be passed into that um, downstream node. And then it triggers a call by saying output complete, and that will get picked up and the other node will start executing at some later moment. So it's a pretty simple model. If you've used CPU programming languages that are based around message passing, the concepts should be very familiar. On the C++ side, this uses a very similar API to ray tracing. It's all built around state objects that are built from different <laughs> libraries. Um, it's probably best to use the D3DX12 state objects header to build those. You, you don't need to, but that contains a bunch of useful helpers that make the code just much easier to work with. You, you, know, you initialize it get a program identifier, and then per frame call dispatch graph, which is the main method that invokes execution of these things. I mentioned that we have a few different launch nodes. I'm gonna go quickly through. There are three options for how a node behaves when it's invoked. Thread launch is conceptually the simplest. Every time you write a payload struct to a thread launch node, that will trigger exactly one thread, which will run and process that payload. In practice, the implementation is probably going to batch these up and try and fill a wave, but it might not. You, know, the, the, you can think of the threads as independent. It's just like one piece of work, and you want one thread to process it. So it's simple for very independent pieces of work. Broadcasting launch nodes are for much bigger things. A broadcast is effectively the same thing as a compute dispatch today. Um, it has a fixed size thread group. You specify the thread group counts as you invoke it, and it's a dimensional grid of and your X, Y, Z size. So you write one payload struct and a whole compute invocation kicks off to process whatever it is that needs processing. The same thing as just calling dispatch today. The final mode is coalescing launch, which is I think the most complex. This is a little bit similar to thread launch in that um, each input record that you provide is processed by one thread. But these get combined in such a way that they can cooperate. So typically what will happen is the implementation will fill a whole wave, launch a wave together, and those threads can share and work together on whatever it is that they're being asked to do. So it allows cooperation across the thread group. There's no guarantee that an entire wave will get packed. You know, at some point the implementation might decide it just needs to go ahead and launch some work if you haven't provided enough messages to fill a whole wave, but it will try to. I'm not gonna go into details about PIX just yet. Austin is gonna talk more about that later. But I wanna say we do have PIX support today for work graphs in a fairly rudimentary form. There's more coming later. And the, the main message, if you take one thing away from this talk is, you know, work graphs is real now. This is the link to go download it. There you will find all the right, the right versions of, you know, what agility SDK do you need? Links to the drivers with the necessary support from AMD or NVIDIA. If you want to use this with Warp, we have complete software rasterizer support for work graphs as well. And that NuGet package will give you a version of Warp that supports this functionality. So you can get going. I mean, the work graphs on the CPU is not terribly interesting. We can already do all this kind of things in CPU code, but it's a good emulation path. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what next. You know, we've been working on this kind of functionality for years now. There is more we want to do with it. This is the first step in a, in a direction that we're not done with. Uh, one thing, if you were at AMD's talk on Monday, you probably saw they were demoing a future extension of launching rasterization from within a work graph. So that basically adds a new node type, which is a mesh shader invocation. Um, we are working with partners to get that functionality standardized and released. I'm pretty excited about that. We are probably at an earlier stage of talking, thinking, not really sure what it looks like yet, around richer synchronization options within a graph, better capabilities for deterministic ordering and that kind of thing. 
And then Austin's going to talk more about where we want to go with debugging and profiling. But there's a lot more we need to do there as well. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rob from AMD, who's going to show some demos and talk about AMD's perspective on this functionality. Hi. OK. Uh, my name is Rob, as Sean said. Um, I work for AMD. I'm a member of our driver team. And I worked on uh, the architecture that built the implementation for our Workraft support in our current drivers that are shipping today. Um, so, yeah. So, AMD is really thrilled to support GPU Workrafts. Um, to give a taste of what this API can do, um, we're showing our compute rasterizer sample application today, which we published last October on GPU Open uh, to accompany the preview release of the uh, Agility SDK that Microsoft launched. The sample implements a compute-based rasterizer to compare the differences between implementing complex pipeline-like algorithms using the new WorkRafts API and comparing that against legacy APIs such as Execute Indirect. The purpose of this demo is not to replace the hardware rasterizer in your GPU, but rather it's meant as a learning exercise to illustrate the differences between what Execute Indirect delivered to developers and what WorkRafts can do, and also how to construct larger, complex, pipeline-like systems using the new WorkRafts API. In this sample, the triangles that are rasterized in the scene are categorized into bins based on their area. Triangles which are too large to fit into any of the bins are going through a separate pass that splits the, into smaller triangles, and then that pass split, sends the smaller triangles into the bins. Um, you can see the graph topology here on the right. Implementing this using execute indirect requires allocating separate buffers for every single bin, as well as for the different splitter passes. And each of these buffers, as Sean mentioned earlier, must be sized for the worst case possible number of triangles in your scene, plus a little extra fudge factor because you don't know up front how many triangles your splitter passes are actually going to create on the fly. So you waste a potentially large amount of memory. In addition, you have to issue a full pipeline barrier after the initial rendering pass uh, that sets up all the triangles in the scene. And categorize them to the bins or to the splitters, and then you have to issue another barrier after the splitters run before you can start actually rasterizing any of the bins. WorkRafts, on the other hand, dynamically sends work to each bin without the developer needing to know upfront what the distribution of triangles in the scene is going to be like, how many triangles are in the scene in total, or anything like that. The worst case memory footprint for WorkRafts is fixed for any scene. Regardless, you know, when you're running on the same GPU on the same driver, every scene will use the same memory footprint, whereas with Execute Indirect, the, the amount of memory you need scales with the complexity of a scene. And on top of that, WorkRafts is also a much more straightforward way to express this sort of topology. In order to do this in Execute Indirect, the developer has to deconstruct the graph in their mind, build a bunch of scaffolding into their application to figure out what the execution order of the different nodes should be, and that's very fragile, and if you want to change your application or your algorithm, you have to change all of that scaffolding. Whereas with work graphs, you express the, the algorithm you want to, to execute in HLSL, defining all the nodes in the graph, and the system just handles the rest for you, and the driver and the hardware provide an efficient implementation for doing so. This means that you have more time to optimize and tune your algorithms without having to worry about building and tweaking and potentially risking breaking all of this complicated, delicate scaffolding that you build up using something like Execute Indirect. Is this playing automatically? Yeah. All right, so we have a pre-recorded video of the rasterizer demo. Um, here we can see the rasterizer demo running on an AMD Radeon RX 7900 XT GPU. The scene here that we're rasterizing is Sponza, and this, this version of the demo has been configured to categorize triangles into 12 different bins. Over on the lower left, you can see a histogram. I think it's covered up by the bar, sorry. A histogram of the different uh, bins in which 
amount of triangles go into each bin. And over on the right, there's a legend that maps each bin of triangle sizes to the color. So we're not doing any texture filtering or sampling here. This is just to rasterize the triangle and visualize the, the bins. If we switch to work graphs, we notice that we have a modest performance increase, which is nice. The scene renders the same, just as before. And the, sorry. The real gain here with work graphs, though, is the memory footprint in this particular algorithm. In order to run the most complex version of this scene, which has over 2.3 million triangles, you use about 3.3 gigabytes of memory for all the 12 bins, plus the execute and direct buffers for the splitter passes. On the other hand, GPU work graphs on this GPU is rasterizing the scene using only 113 megabytes. So a massive orders of magnitude memory reduction and a performance boost, and it's easier to implement. And here is just loading the really big scene, so you can take a look at that. And just millions of triangles. Okay. So in summary, AMD is thrilled beyond measure to support GPU work graphs. We firmly believe that work graphs are the next major revolution in GPU programmability, and we can't wait to see what you guys can build once you get your hands on this. So since this is available today, go get it. Go give it a try. We have a driver that supports GPU work graphs on our RX 7000 series GPUs. We had a talk earlier this week on Monday that Sean mentioned where we went into even more detail. Um, we had a developer tools talk yesterday that mentioned, among other things, some of our GPU tooling support for work graphs. And this compute rasterizer demo, which I showed a little bit of today, is available on GPU Open, where you can read a lot more about the algorithm and also view the source. Really, go try it out. So I'm going to hand over to Wesson now, who's going to present WorkGraphs also running on video GPUs. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, my name is Wissam Bahnesi. I am a DevTech engineer at uh, NVIDIA. And I uh, joined uh, our research and driver team about uh, over a year ago to work uh, on work graphs. So I'm really uh, thrilled to talk about my experience with this cool new feature and what I've learned, uh, what works well with this feature. So us at DevTech, we often receive games that we analyze their uh, performance and their Many of them are CPU bottlenecked. And when we delve deeper to analyze the reasons for that bottleneck, more often than not, it turns out to be uh, frame command generation. So that be your draw thread, your render thread, RHR thread, whatever you call it. Um, thankfully, uh, more and more games uh, have taken the move to GPU-driven rendering and execute indirect. But as you have heard, this also has uh, scalability issues. So with work graphs, can we finally uh, get something like what looks like here in the code, basically where the CPU is ticking its simulation every frame, generating some scene constants, sending those to the GPU, one dispatch graph call, and then the GPU takes uh, care of the rest. Uh, not quite, but it's getting there. So bear with me. Um, so this is um, a sequence of uh, workloads that we commonly see in uh, today's games. Uh, you have uh, GPU calling at the beginning, probably some other uh, like uh, frame initiation uh, workloads. Then comes the rasterization of the gbuffer uh, pass. This is where the bulk of your draw uh, commands happen, followed by uh, lighting, and then probably a few uh, post-processing steps. And then we slap UI on top of all of that. So there's a few more draw calls in there. Uh, in one of my experiments, I took uh, that set of workloads and tried to convert that to a work graph. Uh, this was about a year ago, so we didn't have uh, draw nodes implementation yet. So it was kind of limited to the longest stretch of compute uh, shaders uh, in the frame, which happened to be this set of workloads. Honestly, the uh, lack of draw nodes wasn't their main problem here. The main problem was that it ended up running very slow. And the reason for that was because 
also there wasn't support for resource uh, transitions uh, within the work graph paradigm, which caused us to have to go through hoops and tricks to synchronize uh, the different passes, especially with post-processing, where you, know, you have to make sure that the first pass finishes before moving to the next. Uh, so, yeah, I know I'm probably sounding like I'm a party breaker here, but don't worry, I'll fix your party. <laughs> so just bear with me. Um, if we uh, try to instead not fixate on that uh, goal, but rather take water graphs for what they really bring uh, in terms of uh, comparisons to what uh, DirectX used to support, we have this new unique capability of dynamic shader selection. Uh, yeah, we used to be able to amplify work, but this is not just about uh, amplifying work, but you are also able now, for this amplified work, you are able to choose really which shaders to run for that. So this is quite unique and powerful. Uh, the other thing that I uh, think is also unique for work graphs is this implicit um, micro-barrier uh, thing happening. It is by virtue of a producer generating the work for a, a child or a consumer, there is this micro-dependency happening and it is on a, sm a much smaller scale than a regular barrier. This can help uh, achieve better occupancy on your GPU. So if we take those uh, two main uh, features and try to target them with a sample, we can get into something uh, probably more interesting. Um, yeah, so I told you I would fix your party. Uh, <laughs> so this is a standard deferred shading sample. Um, the only thing unique about it is, um, well, I mean, not exactly, but it's uh, supporting uh, multiple BRDFs uh, in the frame. So rather than just shade everything with the same uh, BRDF, it allows each object to have its own uh, BRDF or material, if you will. So basically, you have your uh, G-buffer uh, passes there. You have the depth uh, normals and the material IDs, and then also the uh, tiled lighting uh, buffer. So the first step uh, of the process is to uh, send a dispatch that partitions the screen into eight by four tiles, and within each tile we collect the relevant lights, store this in a buffer barrier to make sure that this data is ready and safe to access, move to the next step, which is the actual shading, which reads from those uh, like code light lists and evaluates the material for each pixel and the actual logic for the evaluation hides behind this big uh, switch case uh, statement that checks the material type or the BRDF type and runs the proper logic for each case. Now, if we want to take this and convert it to uh, a work graph, we have uh, something as simple as this, but yet it is actually, uh, it, it brings some uh, cool benefits. So you have a root node that works uh, on a per tile basis this root node does the light culling, uh, and uh, also along the way it, uh, it classifies the pixels that are underneath to figure out which BRDF uh, child node to go to. Once it has this decision, it takes the cold light list and sends it down uh, to one of the BRDFs that are supported. So the children here, each one of them is just specialized to handle one particular BRDF. If uh, the tile happens to have multiple materials uh, involved, then it can actually issue more than uh, one child in here. Uh, and with this uh, conversion, we were able to see up to 20% uh, time uh, improvement uh, in the execution of the frame. And uh, so yeah, it was taken between 0 0.8 to one millisecond, um, whereas the standard Uber shader case was more or less always one milliseconds. So the work graph case was showing better performance response to the contents of the screen. Um, and that's thanks to the various things that I mentioned before. So there's, you, you have the specialized shaders uh, that we're executing and getting rid of this uh, barrier in between light culling and uh, the shading. Um, in fact, the performance gains are even higher than that, but you have to consider that work graph execution is not exactly 100% free, so there's overhead, and this eats up a little bit uh, from your gains, so keep that in mind. All right, so um, I have a small list of recommendations for you here. Um, if you want to jump into work graphs, start simple. Um, 
make sure each of your steps are working properly because it will be really time consuming to find where your mistake was once you have like everything in place. Um, try to embrace the design of work graphs and, what, and how they operate rather than trying to come up with your own systems within the system, especially if you find yourself going for globally coherent UAVs. Um, make your nodes do some real considerable amount of work rather than just a small, a few like instructions and bail out because then you will re really be exercising the cost of the system's overhead rather than uh, doing any uh, useful work. Uh, make sure you understand the size of the work of your algorithm uh, and translate those to uh, good limits uh, that are applied on the graph such that you would minimize the amount required for the backing memory for execution. Uh, and finally, yeah, if you really want to do graphics with the uh, uh, current version of four graphs, you can still uh, go ahead and try uh, inline ray tracing. So uh, a bigger list uh, of those recommendations with more details uh, can be found in my second blog post, uh, as well as links to uh, the sample that you just saw, where you can go ahead and look at the code, compare it with both cases, regular dispatch and work graphs, uh, as well as uh, tutorial and uh, other interesting stuff. So yeah, please uh, go ahead and check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you both. So the other new feature I want to talk about today is DirectSR, which we've published a couple of blogs about without going into a ton of detail. And um, this is not shipped yet. So this is the first time we're really going to fill in detail of what DirectSR is and why it exists. So let's start with some motivation. It's you know, very clear looking at game development trends over the last few years that across multiple different hardware architectures and game titles, people have noticed that you know, given a certain amount of performance and power, you can get better image quality by rendering at a lower resolution and then doing some kind of smart upscale compared to just rendering directly at full output resolution. And there is tremendous variety of what that upscaling might look like. There are temporal techniques that blend data across multiple frames, various spatial techniques, um, ML-based techniques are increasingly becoming prominent. There, you know, there are a lot of these things out there. There are many, many games and game engines that ship with their own local implementation of some such technique, platforms that have these techniques built in, uh, multiple vendor solutions from different IHVs. The other thing that's very clear is like, this is an area that is evolving extremely rapidly. New techniques are, com are coming out all the time. Some of the techniques in this kind of zoo of ways of doing upscaling are portable and will run just like on any, on any GPU that can support D3D. Others are very specific to a, pr a precise piece, piece of hardware and are not going to be portable. The other thing that's very clear is that using ML for upscaling is a, a, a space that is not tapped out yet. It's, it's pretty obvious that the larger, the larger an ML model we're able to run for upscaling, the better image quality can come out. And I don't think anyone's yet found the ceiling of just how far that can be pushed. But right now we're at the, boy, every time you make this thing bigger, it, the quality goes up stage of exploring. And the other hardware trend that I think intersects with that in an interesting way, if you look at silicon roadmaps, the ability to do lots of ML processing is increasing faster than just raw GPU computers. So we can speculate that's likely to shift the balance over the next few years towards more use of ML in, in this kind of upscaling. Yeah, the, the key thing to take away from this is that this, this area is moving fast. And so that creates a few problems. Um, games are expected to support all of these techniques. That's just a pain because you have to implement, integrate multiple different things with different APIs. Um, gamers often want to select between different ones. Platforms are very interested in the ability to innovate here and be able to come up with new techniques, ship new techniques, and have those be, a, a, be able to apply to existing games without constantly doing this cycle of, oh, we've invented a new cool upscaling algorithm, and we have to go work with every single game developer, including titles that shipped years ago, to, to integrate this. So there's kind of a two-way problem. You know, platforms want their stuff to work with all the games. Games want to support all the techniques. And it's a bit of a, bit of a mess at the moment. This is exactly the kind of reason that DirectX exists. Like, how do we just put a consistent interface across this kind of, kind of diverse space. 
And because of that, we've built a new API called DirectSR. This is an API that abstracts over multiple different upscaling techniques. We're not trying to just say, oh, there's one solution to rule them all and all upscaling must be done exactly this way from now on. We accept that there are pros and cons to lots of different ways of doing it, and it's good that rapid innovation and experimentation is happening. But boy, it'd be nice if we didn't have to write new code in our games every time somebody experiments. So DirectSR can wrap multiple upscaling techniques. New ones can be added over time. It supports two different categories of upscaling technique. Um, there are some, what we call a built-in variant, which ships as part of the DirectSR runtime. And those variants will be available on all GPUs from all vendors. Other variants can be implemented by the driver, by the IHV, and those will only enumerate when on that specific GPU that supports the capability. It's been designed in such a way that variants can also run on dedicated ML accelerator hardware in the future. So we, you know, we expect to see like, more of these showing up over time. So the, yeah, the programming model is basically you initialize DirectSR, enumerate the available variants. That, that may vary depending on what system you're running on. Either pick which one you want to use if you have a static choice of that, or present that to the user in the options to let them pick if that's how you prefer to approach it. You know, go ahead and use that variant. You submit the upscaling for execution. The app provides the command queue, the, a, com a compute queue to run this on, and then DirectSR will do the upscaling. And then it integrates in very much the kind of standard way that you're used to if you've used any of these techniques today. You'll do the scene rendering, do the upscale, and then render things like 2D user interfaces over the top of that. Um, we're delighted to announce that we have support for DirectSR from AMD, sitting on top of FSR, from NVIDIA, sitting on top of DLSS, and from Intel with XCSS. This upscaling algorithm takes a few different inputs. Um, this is also very typical if you're used to this kind of technique. Some of these are optional, the ones that I've grayed out. It'll work better if you can provide them, but you don't have to provide them. The ones that are not grayed out are required. And Austin will talk again more about this, but DirectSR does have full pick support. This is not released yet. Um, it is coming extremely soon. I'm going to be vague about the word extremely, but stay tuned. And I'm going to hand back to Rob, who's going to show a demo. Thank you again. <clears throat> AMD is delighted to support DirectSR, and uh, to do so, we're making our latest FSR 2.2 super resolution upscaler available through the DirectSR API. This means that all the enhancements derived from our extensive research and development to make games scale great is now available, well, not now, so very soon, available in DirectSR. Uh, AMD's implementation of DirectSR is integrated at the driver level. We, uh, sorry, sorry, not at the driver level, the runtime level, which means that instead of being built into the IHV driver, it's built into the Direct, X, Dress, uh, the Direct SR API itself. This means that we can bring our industry-leading FSR technology directly into, into your hands, enabling gamers using any GPU that supports FSR from any vendor without a driver update. It just works with Direct SR. This means that more gamers benefit from cutting-edge super-resolution technology, and super resolution becomes truly for everyone. This is another demo here. We are showing again the Sponza scene. We like that one, I guess. Um, <laughs> and here we're showing uh, just rendering the scene as normal and upscaling using the FSR2 API. And we take a moment to switch over to the Direct SR API. And we move around again. And the results are the same because. It's the same implementation under the hood. We use the, the, the built-in runtime version of DirectSR, which is built off of our FSR technology. And in the context of FSR, we, sorry. We take the reactive mask, the motion vector mask to determine which pixels are important to, to be upscaled, which ones contribute from this scene's data versus the last frame, and all that's combined with the depth, the color, the motion vectors to produce the super resolution output, which works precisely the same as our super, resolu super resolution 2 technology and many other uh, IHV specific technologies as well. Hi everyone, 
So uh, as Sean mentioned, we do indeed have PIX support for all of this new functionality. So when it comes to direct SR, yes, PIX just works, and it doesn't matter which variant of SR you are using through direct SR, capture replay will just work. Um, as you can see in the screenshot here, you can see the inputs and the outputs to the upscaling. You can use PIX's profiling features to profile the upscaling GPU work relative to the other GPU work that you have in your capture. And yeah, it just works. Um, depending on which variant of SR you use, the UI is a little different. Um, we're going to improve that during the rest of 2024. But as soon as direct SR is available to you, PIX will be available to you and it will just work. And then also when it comes to going back to work graphs as well, um, it's very early days, but yes, PIX has support for work graphs as well. So capture replay just works. You can see the API parameters to all of your uh, dispatch graph calls and all of the other work graph APIs. You can understand the state objects that you are using for your work graphs. You can see the sub objects and the relationships between them in the uh, API objects view up there. You can see the inputs and the outputs. Sorry, you can see the inputs to your uh, work graph dispatch graph call right now, the CPU and GPU inputs, and the local root arguments table, which is conceptually similar to shader tables in ray tracing. So you can see it using the same UI here. And you can use all of the standard performance features and picks that you have today to profile your graph workloads. Um, Next phase is in 2024, where well, we're going to populate more of the pipeline tab here in PIX with info. So yes, you will actually be able to see the outputs from your node shaders and all of the other resources bound to them. And we will have a first round of shader debugging support for node shaders. Um, of course, this is very early days and very basic support for work graphs. Um, we've been having some really good conversations with folks throughout the week about what uh, profiling and debugging work graphs will look like both in the short, medium, and long-term future. If you have thoughts on this, please come find us afterwards and chat with us. We'd love to hear it. Um, we'll also share contact info at the end of the deck, and if you'd prefer to contact us that way, please do get in touch. So what else has the PIX team been up to? Um, well, in, as well as supporting the new APIs like DirectSR and WorkGraphs on day one, we have added support for all of the other new D3D12 APIs that have been supported. Um, that's on day one or very nearly on day one. And then beyond that as well, we have been tackling a lot of other functionality in PIX and adding a lot more features. Um, unfortunately, I can't talk through all of them today. There is an awful lot. But I recommend that you check out the PIX blog to see all of that info. But there are two categories of features that I wanted to talk about today and share with you. And these have all been driven by customer feedback that we've heard from our users. The first one is improving PIX's performance, so the performance of PIX itself. In October 2023, we had a really big release of PIX on Windows, um, the biggest in a good couple of years that had a lot of performance improvements to PIX. And um, things that used to take operations that used to take minutes or potentially even longer in PIX on Windows can now be done in seconds. It makes it much easier to access a whole range of data within PIX on Windows. Um, if you haven't used PIX since October 2023, I really recommend checking it out and uh, seeing the improvements for yourselves. And then just last week, um, we, did ship, uh, we did chip support for uh, work graphs in PIX, but at the same time, we also shipped some other performance improvements and we've heard good feedback from users that the shader debugging startup times were too slow. And so we've made some really good improvements there, particularly for very large shaders. And so please try it out and let us know how it goes. And uh, we have also been hearing feedback that parts of the PIX UI can be a bit sluggish sometimes. So we have made some really good performance improvements there in this release. And yes, uh, this has been an ongoing effort, as you can tell, for probably over a year now to improve PIX's performance. Um, this is going to be an ongoing effort into the future as well. Um, I'm very excited about some of the improvements that are going to be coming in a couple of months to, again, speed up replay performance even more than we've done in the October release. And then there'll be another round of UI performance improvements as well. So stay tuned to the PIX blog for more info when that's available.
The second round of uh, features that I did want to chat about today were ray tracing features. So we've heard key feedback from a lot of users that folks wanted more debugging functionality for ray tracing within PIX, and we have delivered a lot of this over the past year. So starting with shader debugging for ray gen, hit, and miss shaders, that's all available now. Uh, ray visualization for uh, DXR 1.0 ray tracing usage, so you can see in the screenshot here, you can visualize the rays bouncing around your scene. The TLAS and the BLAS hierarchy tree, as you can see in the bottom right corner there. And the DXR invocations view, so you can see all of the shader invocations triggered by a given dispatch rays call. We plan to add more ray tracing features to PIX in the rest of 2024. Um, there's a bit of a theme here, but if you have thoughts on what you would like to see in PIX, please get in touch with us. And uh, that's just about it for all of the PIX things that I wanted to talk about, but there is one other thing that I'd like to share with you all, um, which is, as of this morning, the uh, WinPIX event runtime was open sourced on GitHub under MIT. Oh. <laughs> um, and so uh, the NuGet package will also be open sourced on MIT, or will also be moved over to MIT probably tomorrow. Um, hopefully this will make it easier for you all to include WinPIX event runtime in your games. But we have also open sourced the decoder for WinPix events. So hopefully it will make it easier for you to include uh, PIX event support in your own tools. Uh, thank you. And so at the, uh, at the same time, we have also published a proposal for a new PIX API. This is mostly for CPU profiling, but uh, PIX begin task so that you can track tasks and task graphs and dependencies between them on the CPU usage and eventually see this in the PIX UI. Um, please, if you have interest in this, please check out the proposal. It's on the GitHub issues page um, and share your thoughts. And so that really is it from me, so I'll pass you back to Sean. So wrapping up, before we finish entirely, I want to talk about a few smaller features that we've shipped recently. Um, Shader Model 6.8 was released last week. The primary new thing in the Shader Model is, of course, support for work graphs, but that's not the only thing in the Shader Model. Um, one small but I think significant quality of life improvement is the wave size range attribute. We've always had support in it, or not always, we, for a while we've had support in HLSL to put an attribute on shaders declaring, like, I need a specific wave size. That can now be a range. And this means you can indicate things like, hey, you know, this shader is compatible with wave 32 or wave 64, but please don't execute it with any, anything other than those two. And I think that's going to be really helpful to address a lot of compatibility issues that game developers and IHVs have been struggling with. We added a few new input semantics, SV start vertex location and SV start instance location, which just quality of life improvement when working with draw instance. We expanded the comparison sampling capabilities, adding sample compare gradient and sample compare bias, which were just make, making that set of functionality more orthogonal than it previously has been. I spent a lot of the first part of this talk explaining why we want to move past execute indirect to something more flexible. We did revisit execute indirect in this release. We added a new D3D12 indirect argument type incrementing constant. This is basically a new, new, a new variant of a root signature, a root constant, which you can bind through an execute indirect argument buffer, which is automatically incremented every time the execute indirect steps from, from one operation to the next. So you can get a you know, different version of that value for each indirect operation, and that's, again, you know, useful flexibility for instancing and various other kinds of operation. Uh, we've added support for generic programs. This is taking the Dixel library way of specifying shaders that we introduced with DXR and have generalized for work graphs and generalizing it still further. So you can now define graphics PSOs and compute PSOs that same way. If you want to just move into this you know, new way of describing shaders and unify your code base, you can use that across everything rather than having to have like my graphics PSOs are built this way, my ray tracing ones this other way. And we have released GPU upload heaps. 
This is a feature that's been in developer preview for a while. It's no longer in preview as of last week. A GPU upload heap is a video memory allocation that the CPU can directly write into, um, going over, over the PCI bus, not having to copy through an upload heap in the previous, previous way. There is a limitation. This feature does require a Windows operating system update. The version of Windows with that support is not yet released. So right now, the D3D part of this is released. You can start using it. You need to be on the Windows Insider program to get a matching operating system build. This is unfortunately not something we can support on existing in-market versions of Windows due to some nasty hardware deadlock bugs with certain types of peripheral that we ran into that needed some OS kernel fixes. So wrapping everything up, um, main call to action is like try out work graphs. You can try them out tomorrow, this evening. <laughs> Go back to your hotel rooms and start writing cool graphs and see what happens. Stay tuned for direct SR. That's going to show up very, very soon. And make sure you have the latest version of PIX. You know, Austin talked about a lot of the really awesome improvements there. You know, if, if you're frustrated by PIX being too slow and you're on an old build, upgrade, because there's a lot of goodness in the latest build. And the final thing I wanted to say is, you know, please get in touch if you have feedback on anything that we talked about here today, anything that we didn't talk about here today, anything that you think we should have been talking about here today, anything that's not working the way you think it should be. We really value feedback. So much of the decisions we make in Direct3D and in PIX are driven by hearing from, from you what problems you need us to go solve. Um, best ways to get in touch, the Ask Win PIX alias is a fantastic way to basically send email directly to Austin, who does read them all. Um, we have a Discord, which I know sending you to a Discord as a support channel sounds a bit like it's, I'll just go off over to Discord and we'll ignore it. That's not the case. The core Direct3D and PIX product members and ATG developer support folk and a lot of expert Microsoft employees spend time every day in that Discord answering questions and feeding information back into the team's planning process. So you really will you know, ask a question there, you will get an answer from somebody who knows, whether someone in the community or someone at Microsoft. It's a... It works, we'd love to hear from you. you know, if you find a bug, tell us about it. That way we can get it fixed. Um, that is the end of my talk. I want to say thank you for being here. And I think we have about five minutes for questions. If anybody has any, please step up. Hi, I'm a reporter with PC Mag, and I was just wondering if you could give an update on direct storage, if there's anything new going on there, if, if that's something you can talk about. Um, I can talk about it. Yeah, I don't have a lot to say. Um, direct storage was released last year, I think. Cassie's going to wave at me if I'm wrong about that. Um, it's the, in the process of being integrated into titles now. I think we've seen a couple of early titles ship using direct storage, and there are a lot more in the works. So we're at the kind of rollout stage of excited to see it becoming used more widely. Do you have, because I, I think a lot of gamers are just kind of wondering like when, are, when they're going to see it in a game and can you talk about the adoption rate or? Um, I can't announce things on behalf of game developers, obviously. That would be a question for, for, for the title teams and publishers. Um, yeah. We know, we know which hardware partners we we're working with and which developers. It's not for me to pre-announce their functionality. Um, hi. Uh, do you plan uh, for Direct SR? Do you plan on adding um, NVIDIA DL DLSS, and uh, do you plan on making it uh, Direct SR the standard interface for every constructor uh, upscaler? So um, NVIDIA are supporting Direct SR with using DLSS as the driver backend. Um, in terms of you're making it the standard for everything, we want it to be an option. I think there's, there are, you know, very similarly to how we think about other, other features in GPUs, there are always going to be interesting kind of cutting edge things that one platform wants to experiment with, which we don't necessarily standardize into DirectX. My, my goal is that when someone just wants to do super resolution, they should be able to just use DirectSR, like everything that's valuable and that is, has kind of proven, passed the test that it's going to stick around and have, 
have some longevity should be accessible through DirectSR, running across all the implementations from all of the vendors. Okay, thank you. Hi, can you share any hints of uh, what the structure of the SDK is going to be? Is it going to be an open source repository or will it be like an user interface and a black box? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, yeah, so the Agility SDK, is it going to be an open source repository with all the source and the uh, <coughs> implementation or? Mm -hmm. So the Agility SDK is not open source. That's a new yeah. package that gotcha. we ship yeah, out of band from Windows releases so we can run it everywhere. We're not open sourcing that. We are open sourcing the PIX event runtime right. at this yeah. point. No, okay. no plans beyond that. Gotcha. Hello. Uh, do you think you could uh, use the uh, direct SR API to do denoising? Uh, we're not targeting denoising today. That, that's definitely an interesting direction. I'd love to hear feedback if that's something you'd find useful. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, so will it be possible to modify the shaders that the uh, super resolution things are running under the hood, like for FSR, for example, could be able, be able to like modify those shaders, or is it going to be just a black box with some modifications? Mm -hmm. um, today, if you're using DirectSR, that's pretty much a black box. The, the modification, there are some controls over you know, input parameters and the selection of which variant. It's, you know, it's not open source. It's not, you can't customize the shaders that it's running on. I see. So uh, it's also not possible to add another like implementation, like our own implementation behind, like underneath uh, uh, DirectSR, OpenSR. Um, not today. I'd be super interested in having a conversation if that's something you'd find useful to understand, you know, what what you're trying to do and whether that's something we should we should figure out how to enable. So definitely follow up about that. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so I have a question regarding GPU upload heaps. Um, so could you please elaborate more on uh, the dependencies you talked about, Windows OS update? Uh, I'm using the Agility SDK preview version. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe it is pretty, like, a uh, fairly recent version. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I, don't, I, I still don't uh, see the GPU upload heap, su heap support on my application. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, like, what, what are these uh, OS uh, update dependencies? Yeah, so you basically need to be on a pre-release version of Windows to use GPU upload heaps, which today means if you sign up for the Windows Insider program yes. and switch your machine to a, to a system that's running that, then okay. you will get support. So do you know which win Windows Insider build I um, should be running? Anything from the last six months should, should have the necessary fixes. Okay. If that's not working, follow up and we'll figure it out. <laughs> it should be, but yeah. we, can, we can send some diagnostics and figure out why that's not lighting up. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. We are at time, so thank you everybody. I really appreciate you coming.